the actual production is shot in England. And also Star Wars, by the nature of the exotic environments that we deal with, we sort of travel all around the globe and uh, have things going on on various continents, actually. Action! The fun begins. How long before you can make the jump to light speed? Take a few minutes for the Navi computer to calculate the coordinates. A few minutes? Are you kidding? At the rate they're gaining? Uh, no, what is it? <laughs> you have to shoot this. Traveling through hyperspace is like Dustin, ain't like Dustin Crops, kid. Without precise calculations, we fly too close to a store. They're bouncing to a supermarket and then... <laughs> yeah. Be a hell of a mess. What's that? Watch. We're losing the deflector shields. Go strap yourselves in. Be careful on the way out. Yeah, sure. I'm taking a bit of caution. Okay, you... <laughs> Go away! Without too near a supermarket? <laughs> the Star Wars series started out as a movie that ended up being so big that I took each act and cut it into its own movie. But in order to create that movie, I had to create a backstory. And there's this very elaborate backstory that, that was created in order to get to the point of the first part of Star Wars, the first film. And uh, it's that backstory that hasn't been told yet. This story, the one that we've seen, pays off in a much larger way because it's, it's the, uh, uh, you get a sense it's the son vindicating the father. Uh, but we are doing this in a context that we don't know what, where the father came from or what made him be what he is or what needs to be vindicated. <laughs> so we're just seeing the sort of vindication without, you know, the, the, the act being seen and so it's very interesting uh, and, and we don't really understand I think clearly what the conflict is uh, at this point. The original concept really related to a father and a son and twins, I mean a son and a daughter and it was that relationship that was the core of the uh, of the story um, and uh, it went through a lot of machinations before I even got to the first draft screenplay uh, and, uh, you know, various characters changed shapes and sizes and, and, uh, there, uh, it isn't really until, uh, it evolved into what is close to what Star Wars now is that then I began to go back and deal with the stories that evolved to get us to that point and that, you know, uh, it's hard to say really where the, you know, how it evolves into a, into a, a piece. George talked about Star Wars and he, he didn't have a title yet, but the concept for a film that was going to be a big galactic war. And then when he started to talk to Fox, uh, it seemed to him a good idea to have some illustrations to show the, the scope of the visuals that he planned, which I think in George's mind was a big part of the movie. And I told him that I'd love to do it. He and Gary came over one day with the script. I started on it the same day. I, I, mean, I, I really got into it right away, working on those original uh, paintings that were really done to sell the film. George and Gary went off, uh, left me doing more paintings. Fox wanted me to do more paintings. Gary and George went to England and started scouting this whole thing from a budget point of view. Came back uh, three or four weeks later saying, looks like they're going to do this film. I never really thought it would be a film while I was working on those original paintings. I, it seemed so vast a project to me. There was quite a few things set up by George, and I felt I was drawing what he wanted things to look like. I don't think that either of us thought that's the way the movie was going to look, necessarily. These were just sketches that were the best we could do in terms of how we felt it should look, but not necessarily the end product in the sense that this was really going to be it. But it sort of turned out to be it in the end, for the most part. And some of those paintings were virtually rendered intact on, onto the screen in Star Wars for certain scenes. Everything came either from my sketches or Ralph's paintings and, and drawings and uh, any input that George might have, you know. There wasn't a lot of 
outside influences on Star Wars. With his Star Wars contract completed, George Lucas now needed a rebel force up to the challenge of production. In the summer of 1975, he founded the visual effects company Industrial Light and Magic. We were kind of like a weird kind of fraternity of robotic photography nuts or something like that. We moved into a big empty warehouse in Van Nuys, right near the Van Nuys airport and basically started from scratch. I mean, it was empty. We took the concept of motion control, which is essentially an old concept of being able to duplicate camera motion through more than one pass so that you can generate multiple elements of film, and we made it production savvy by tying it into a computer, which was at that point custom-built microprocessors. There were no PCs. You didn't go down buying a PC. We, we built them from scratch. At the same time the camera system was being built, another team began constructing model spaceships. This shot was the first shot that was completed by ILM. We printed out a big picture and framed it and everybody signed it and gave it to George and it said, at the bottom it said, our first shot. That was at the point where we'd spent some millions of dollars to get the visual effects facility up and running. Fairly early on that the idea of a space dogfight uh, came into play of wouldn't it be uh, interesting to take that kind of uh, uh, visual excitement and put it into outer space. So um, it was written, I think, very early on. It's in almost all the drafts of the screenplay. And um, in order to, I had, had no idea at that point how I was going to accomplish it. So it really wasn't until I sat down to, to figure it out and, and got together with uh, some of the people who I brought in to start ILM that we began to, to focus on the fact that we would have to create a different technology in order to accomplish that. The, the approach that I had, which is to do it editorially rather than pictorially, um, I think I had from the very beginning because it seemed inconceivable that I could actually do what Kubrick had done in 2001 uh, and you know have it be done for any kind of amount of money that I would have access to. So I figured I would you know, do it by sleight of hand uh, using a lot of editorial techniques. And so I had to create something that was in motion. And we did um, some uh, what we call videomatics, which we'd take little models and move them around on video and transfer that. And we did do some little animated pieces with very crude animation. And uh, then I took you know, footage from actual dogfights that, you know, we got out of gun cameras in World War I and World War II and, and uh, you know, various documentaries and that sort of thing. And, and out of that created a sequence that is more uh, visual in motion. We have always had to use some kind of device to give you the sense of motion. For the end battle of New Hope, I used bits and pieces from documentary films about World War II and war footage of airplanes flying and that sort of thing. Here they come. into which Luke Skywalker is thrust is derived from World War II dogfights as shown in Hollywood films. For the space age dogfight, detailed models are used. With the computer controls developed especially for Star Wars, it was possible to film the elements for this sequence with a freedom never before exercised in motion picture production. By controlling the motion of the camera, and by remembering those motions, the computer allows for more complex and visually dynamic photography. Again, the models are photographed against blue screen to allow for the placement of other elements into the scene. Something as large as Star Wars, which is a very, very complicated kind of movie, 
It really needs a lot of people all working together to make it happen. In fact, Han Solo's space freighter, the Millennium Falcon, was Star Wars' most elaborate set. It was constructed on one of the nine sound stages the company used at the Elstree Studios outside London. I know it's not very pleasant, R2, but we have to show the Death Star. Of course I care about upsetting a fellow droid, but we can't stop now. We must get on with our journey aboard the Millennium Falcon. The Falcon, in which the intrepid adventurers are traveling, is in fact a model. Designed and built by a Hollywood special effects house, it is photographed by a computer-controlled camera. By photographing the model against a blue screen, it will later be possible to add different backgrounds and other moving objects to the scene. This can be done by means of double and triple exposures. The work is painstaking and precise. It is an endeavor where details count. the Millennium Falcon, the concept model wasn't anything like it became. The Falcon started out as the blockade runner. We finished it, photographed, sent it to uh, England because they had a bunch of, of um, carpenters, like three, four hundred carpenters waiting for it. And the social producer, Jim Nelson, was like flipping out. <laughs> there was a show on TV at the time in England called Space 1999. And the word was that we copied that ship. Well, I'd never seen the show, and it was coincidence that they were both long and slender, and they had an engine cluster here, and they had a cockpit up here. But that's, that's it. And George wanted something different. He said something, well, make the ship kind of like a hamburger, you know, the bun and sorry, the meat in the middle, like that. And then another word that he said was something like, well, I want it like a hamburger, but how about when it, when it actually flies, it flies like a sunfish, so it's a long, narrow thing, and that's why it had that rotating cockpit. For some reason, that idea died real quickly. There was a mad rush. We had to get this thing done in like a few weeks so that we wouldn't keep these people waiting in England. And we had everybody in this, well, the, the camera guys dropped their work, they were making parts, and then uh, they brought it to us and we just put stuff on it. But in a way that Joe Johnson wanted, and we, I mean, it had to look mechanical. And uh, that, that ship was built really, really quickly and became iconic. Who would have known?
Streaming our favorite shows, keeping in touch with our loved ones, and even our banking is mostly done online these days. We'd like to think our information is safe, but as our online footprint increases, so does our need for proper security. Surfshark adds an extra layer of security when you're online to keep all of your passwords, photos, and videos safe. There's a lot of websites and hackers that take your info without you even knowing it, but you can swim under their radar using Surfshark VPN, a virtual private network. Surfshark is a VPN service that protects your information by encrypting all of the data that you send through the internet. You can stop websites from tracking your info and selling targeted ads to you. With the click of a button, you can forget about data mining and intrusive advertisements. One of my favorite features of Surfshark is that you can see content not available in your area. Disney Plus or Netflix, for example, have different movies for each country. Access should not be tied to a region. In China, YouTube and most social media websites are banned. With Surfshark, you can solve the problem by simply changing your location. Just connect to the service and refresh the page. Surfshark is an app and browser extension that enables you to place your laptop or phone anywhere in the world and allows you to access the internet as if you were in that country. You can watch any content anywhere in the world on any of your devices. Surfshark turns you into an anonymous and hard to trace online user and makes the internet a safer and more enjoyable place for you. I use Surfshark every day. It automatically starts up whenever I start my PC and whenever I need it, I activate it with just one click. Surfshark is the only VPN to offer one account to use on an unlimited number of devices. If you want both protection and freedom online, use my code NMSW, short for Not My Star Wars, to get 83% off plus three extra months for free. Surfshark offers a 30 day money back guarantee, so there's no risk to try it out for yourself. The link is in the description below. In Colin Cantwell's original concept model, the, of course, it has the long nose just like the real X Wing had. But uh, we were also amused that the, the body of that is actually a dragster body. It's, that's what makes that long, long nose. His models were kind of lightweight, not as swarthy, not as strong looking. So we took some of the ideas, which I think was originally Ralph McQuarrie's idea. He had a small X-wing in a painting. And uh, George had this idea of a used universe. I remember the idea came down from him. And he didn't want anything too slick or too well painted. or It also needed to look aged. And also uh, boilerplate technology. Everything had to look like it had been riveted together assembled rather than just a slick mono shape. We changed quite a bit from the concepts for the X-Wing. And one of the reasons was to make it look stronger, but also it had to contain motors for the ship to go into an X. We carved it uh, out of wood. We didn't always do that, but that particular case we did. It also had uh, a lot of tank parts, and all along the backside where the engine is and the back end and that kind of thing had, it was really well and completely detailed. But the X-Wing, you know, became a very, very important model. There was a lot of emphasis on the X-Wings. They could use a good pilot like you. You're turning your back on them. What good's a reward if you ain't around to use it? Besides, attacking that battle station ain't my idea of courage. It's more like suicide. was featured in some of uh, Ralph McQuarrie's early concept illustrations. Kind of harkens back to the uh, P-38, you know, the two fuselage fighter plane of World War II. I think the Y-Wing particularly is an uh, interesting uh, idea, an interesting ship. It reminded me a little bit of a 57 Thunderbird. It had kind of a sleekness to it. As we worked on it and added details to it, it took on more of a kind of a cobbled together hot rod look. We had a lot of freedom in interpreting the concept models and a lot of the time the direction that they took was determined more by the kind of parts that we could find to build them. Like I remember the uh, front of the rocket engine was actually a legs container. That was a plastic container for a hose that we could just get at a, a drugstore. All the, the smaller fighter models had to be produced and molded in foam to make explosion versions of them. That's a bit more difficult and time consuming to make sure that every detail that's put on there could be pulled out of a mold. The concept for the TIE Fighter is much more spindly. You can see that little round shape is, has no real detail on it, it's just a little ball and the, 
the rods and the wings are very lightweight and thin. The final TIE fighter also changed radically for color. The bad guys all had this kind of a dark military blue battleship color, and uh, the, the good guys were a little bit lighter value. On the TIE fighter, we did kit bashing, but there's so many shapes. The multi-spoke thing on the wheel, the ball that isn't totally a ball that goes off into a more of a hexagonal side pieces, all of those had to be carved individually. They weren't kit bashed. The kit bashing part of it is the little tiny little details, and we knew that since you had a key light all of the sun, it would create all these little hard shapes, hard little lines and everything on the shadows. They do have a certain amount of bashed kits in there, but the bulk of it is carved in wood or plastic and then molded. You can definitely tell Darth Vader's ship because it doesn't have those big long wings up the side, you know, it's more condensed. The cockpit is exactly the same, or at least almost exactly the same, but the wings were just made different so you definitely knew which ship Darth Vader was in when, they, when it appeared on the screen. Stay in attack formation. At the very beginning, we didn't think like there'll be a special TIE fighter for Darth Vader, but they knew they set them out in space and they're flying around. Well, who's who? You know, what do you put a big sign on that says this is Darth Vader's ship? Or, you know, how do, how do you do that? Because even when you go in for a close-up on the face and then when you go to a far away shot, if all the TIE fighters are exactly the same, you know, which one is he? I have you not. Curiously enough, there was even a drawing that was called a double cockpit TIE fighter that was similar to Darth's. And uh, we nicknamed that the Double Chili Tie because there was a place you could get chili dogs near where we worked. In the original of the Star Destroyer, Ralph McQuarrie was the one that did this little triangular thing, maybe about an inch and a half long, that was in one drawing, incidentally. And George really liked that idea. And then he then hired a model maker. This was before there ever was an ILM that they made these concept models. You know, it was really fun to build because a lot of the uncertainties about what it was, like the proportions of it and the shape and all that stuff was pretty well nailed down. One of the things that was very important was to try and transmit to people what the scale of the thing really was, how big it was. And we knew that the way that when you fly over a city, you tell the difference between flying over Poughkeepsie, Illinois and Los Angeles is by how many lights there are. We put tens of thousands of fiber optics in that particular ship, and fiber optics allow you to have this little tiny little pinpoint of light. We had a light source on the inside of it, it was a projection lamp, and then it went out to travel down all of these fiber optics to different pinpoints on the ship. There was a tungsten halogen bulbs that were inside the ship, which are very hot and require cooling, and uh, there was a compressed air system them to cool those off. It was like a little miniature uh, nuclear reactor out there on the stage. We tried to, to transmit scale to people on all the ships. It was like big ships have hundreds of thousands of lights, little ships have one or two or three or five, you know. So uh, right from the beginning you'd say, ah, oh, this is really a big ship because it has lots of lights on it. The Darth Vader Star Destroyer, the original idea to save money was to just take the regular white Star Destroyer and paint it blue. From a model maker's point of view, the problem with that is it had tens of thousands of little fiber optics that we would have to scrape to get the lights exposed. And also we knew that just because they tell you that they're through shooting the white Star Destroyer, it doesn't mean they really are. Joe Johnson started drawing that really long, 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 narrow arrow is really what it looks like. We were going to make this whole new Darth Vader ship, which was called eventually the Executor, but to make it be really huge, we needed to have more lights. So if the eight-foot white Star Destroyer had about 100,000 lights, Darth Vader's ship then, since it was so much bigger, had to have many more lights. We couldn't use fiber optics because we were already reaching the max at around 100,000 fiber optics. So what we did was doing artwork and then etching into brass these little tiny holes. We could draw up one panel, reduce it down, count how many lights would be per inch, and we eventually came up with around 250,000 lights. So you just knew that this is really, really big, both with that ship and the white Star Destroyer, so they were big and people would sit around and they'd work on this section. And then I'd say every four hours or something, I'd say, well, we'll move two feet, you know, and have somebody else rotate so that you wouldn't get one person's style that would dominate only in one area, and then somebody else's style that would develop in another area. But we worked seven days a week for about seven weeks to do that. Scenes filmed on the London sound stages will also be integrated with the model shots made in California. 
To achieve this, the actors must also be filmed against a blue screen. Don't tell anybody about us. In the Falcon cockpit, the actors play out their terror at being caught in a magnetic pull exerted by a yet unpictured space. Death Star. It's too big for a space station. I have a very bad feeling about this. Turn the ship around. Yeah. I think you're right. Full reverse, Chewie! In order to complete the scene, it is necessary to generate what the special effects people call mats. pulling us in. They permit the separate elements to be printed one at a time. In this case, the actors, the graphic of the Death Star, and a star field. When finally combined, the star field, the Death Star graphic, the model, and the actors filmed on stage contribute to the creation of a dramatic sequence. Colin Cantwell's original concept model for the Death Star, it's silver, and then it has these little doodads. We eventually knew that it ruins the scale of things to make them shiny, you know, especially silver, it wouldn't look very good. It was just the most rudimentary uh, object, that's concept models. And uh, do you know that they were used for jo with George to go to the studios to have something visual to, to talk about, to say, well, there'll be an X-Wing, and it will have a fight, battle with this, and this will be the Death Star, and all that kind of stuff. So to to somehow convince studios that this is a reasonable idea, a reasonable project that he wants to do. For the most part, they were matte paintings. There was a matte painting of the Death Star for the first Star Wars New Hope. When we were doing the Death Star surface, the laser tower that was a part of the concept art that Joe Johnston and Ralph McQuarrie were doing, we created them in a couple of different sizes, the small size and the bigger size. But when you, ha when you want to do a close-up, you can't close in on a, a model that's this big and have it fill up the full screen. And that's what, when we build the big model, you get in close to that uh, laser tower. We didn't use a lot of reference for building these things. It was, I think, most of the model makers for Star Wars considered that there's a kind of a, mes a mechanical aesthetic that we all appreciated and tried to put into the models that a certain arrangement of exhaust pipes look cool. A large barrel with cooling rods and ammo packets can just be arranged in a way that sculpturally and aesthetically looks interesting and fun. The surface of the Death Star, until now seen only as a graphic, must now be rendered as a model. To effect attacks on the model by the rebel planes, explosions are sometimes triggered by primitive mechanisms. Similarly, the miniature planes are wired with small charges. It took two years and three and a half million dollars to do the Star Wars miniature and optical effects. This camera provides a pilot's eye view of an attack on the Death Star. Thousands of hours are devoted to collecting all the elements necessary for the final sequence. Seven to the four, take one, and three, coming. 
This ship carries the crest of Alderaan. Was there any of the royal family on board? Who were you carrying? Sixteen Tech Nine. And action! Where is the data you intercepted? What have you done with those information tapes? We intercepted no information. This is a consular ship, didn't you see the markings? We're on a diplomatic mission. Where are those tanks? Uh, only the commander knows that. This ship carries the crest of Alderaan. Was there any of the royal family on board? Who were you carrying? <sighs> <sighs> Two take five. Action. Well, there we are. Moss Isley's spaceport. You will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. We must be cautious. I'm ready for anything. Two eleven take three, guy track. Action! Two to eight, take six. And action. Yeah, I was just on the way to see your boss. Tell Jabba I've got his money. That's what you said yesterday. But it's too late. I'm not going back to Jabba with another one of your stories. Yes, but this time I've got the money. Then I'll take it now. I don't have it with me. Tell Jabba... It's too late, I think. Jabba would rather have your ship. Over my dead body. <laughs> That's the idea, Solo. Now you will come outside with me. Or must I finish it in here? I don't think they'd like another killing in here. They'd hardly notice. Get up. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Yes, I'll bet you have. You can cut. Okay, that was great. Say 228, take 7, pick up. Turn it up. We're on action. I don't think they'd like another killing in here. They'd hardly notice. Get up. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Yes, I'll bet you have. Here's where the fun begins. Well? Hello? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, action! Just go again. And go! Keep going, clear the corridor! Now, Jack! Keep in the doorway! Take that, take four. Imagine. That old man's mad. You said it, Chewy. Boy, where'd you dig up that old fossil? Yeah, great at getting us into trouble. I didn't hear you give any ideas. 
Yo, look, a minute ago you said you didn't want to just wait here and be captured. Now all you want to do is stay? Marching into the detention area is not what I had in mind. But they're going to kill her. Better her than me. No, 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 Han. I've seen her. She's so beautiful. So is life. Take two, six, three, take two. And action! Oh. There she is. Chief Review, do you copy? I read you, sir. Are you safe? Hold a moment. We're in the anger, across from the ship. We're right above you. Stand by. You came in that thing? Oh, God, you're braver than I thought. Nice. Come on. Two seven one, take three, pick up. Two cameras. In you go, fire. Right, smoke up. Too much. We didn't die a bit. And action. Here they come. We're going to need it. 478, take one. Just take Pete. Yes. And action. Your power is a weak old man. You should not come back. You can't win, Darth. If my blade should find its mark, you will cease to exist. And I warn you, if you strike me down, I shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Huh? Yeah. Action. Ha <laughs> You! Glad you were here to see it. Now let's get some distance before that thing goes. Now let's get some distance before that thing goes supernova. How do you pronounce supernova? What inflection? Supernova or supernova? Please like, subscribe, and comment on the video. May the Force be with you. Impressive. The most impressive.